Lord, one today is Thursday, April 18, 2024, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule. We're having some technical difficulties here, but it looks like we could do a screen share. Uh, the camera is, uh, has crapped out and the banner has fallen off the wall. Uh, if it can't go wrong, it will go wrong, I guess. So what are we talking about? Well, current market conditions, I have a lot to say about that, obviously. Your questions on trading your favorite stock and crypto picks. Hold off until we get to the live charts. I'm going to start with crypto and then we'll move into stocks. I'll do a brief update on stocks. We'll look at some sector action and then we'll hop into uh, your favorite stock picks. I want to continue my series on what it means to be a trend following moron. We have a lot of other stuff to cover though. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. I want to. Follow up on crypto. It's not about the crypto trading is trading. You're trading traders and not markets. And also, we could be in another bear market. And I'll get to that in just one second as far as crypto is crypto is concerned. Uh, I had some new potential, at least fodder for research. I had some stuff I noodled around with. I had found a couple things that were pretty interesting, but I think there's a lot more to flesh out. The problem is you start going on that going down that rabbit hole. And you could end up spending a lot of time. And, and I, I did that today, but I think I'm I'm going to get somewhere with it or I'm getting somewhere. Anyway, if you want to attend these live, if you're watching the recording on YouTube, davelander.com slash webinar will get you into the host, which is go to webinar. And then you can also join me at YouTube when it works. And it looks like it's working this week. Thank goodness. So, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them there. And who's uh, Andre is there? Okay, good. This is claim screen. As you know, you can lose money trading ours off the summit up. All predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. And that's from Greg Morris. All right, once again, you're trading traders and not markets. And then also remember when, and I've said this several times, but remember when I said that there's a two to three week crypto bull bear market cycle. Well, I think we're in that bear phase now and we'll we'll take a look at that in just one second. So just following up, this was a setup that's similar to my core methodology where you have a thrust and then you have a pullback. And this was a newer coin or token or whatever it is. And those seem to have some excitement to them kind of like the IPOs. Anyway, so here's all the trades. And this is one of the few that I'm still long. I think it's the only one I'm still long. And as I mentioned quite often, I'm not betting the form with this crypto, especially these shit coins, SHYT coins. And in this particular case, I usually put about a thousand in each one. And I must have my account must have been filled up or something, and I just had 457 left. So I did that, took profits at 20%, took $273 off for a whopping $44 profit. The other thing I did was I put in a order at $1, which is 100% return to mine off, so to speak, $25. As I've said before, being the nerd that I am, I did look into mining years ago, and I realized that it's just not cost prohibitive. The maintenance on the hardware, the expense to run the hardware, as I said quite a bit, you could buy a miner, and I think you'd even buy a new one, a, an older model, a new one from 250 bucks or so, and you can plug it in and it'll lose 10 bucks a day. <laughs> it depends on where you live in the United States, maybe even more. So the mining, I think unless you're a, a big boy, it, it's really not worthwhile. Maybe after this having or having or whatever, yeah, it, it, that should only make it worse, I should say. So it, it's going to be even worse. But anyway, my thinking was, what if I mined off a little money here and there and kept it in native currency? And that experiment didn't go so hot. I didn't really track it that well, but I only ended up with about 600 bucks of leftover shit coins by doing that. So the new experiment is to mine off $25 here and there when these things hit the IPT or if they rally up 100% or more. And I'll show you one here in a second where it rallied twice on that. In fact, right here, you can see this is a double of a double. So another $25 came off there. 
And my thinking is you're going to have these spikes. And if you put a limit order for a token amount, like 25 bucks here and there, you're not going to get rich, but you're also going to get a, a return on the spike that you might not get had you not have that limit order in. Let's say it spikes and keeps on going. Well, that's that's the best of both worlds. You take a little tiny bit off the table and you still have a big enough position on to make some decent money out of the deal. Now, this game might be over for a little while, but that's okay. Things change quickly in crypto. And I'll show you that when we get to crypto in just one second. So that's a 300% run, much better than the Pokemon. You know, as I've been saying quite a bit, you don't need a fortune to trade these things. And the reason I'm spending so much time talking about them is, again, I don't know I'm beating a dead horse here, but it's a it's a great way to get your reps in without spending a fortune. If you're going to jump in and trade stocks, you need a little bit more money. And that's my bread and butter longer term. And that's where the real money is. But this crypto right now, at least last week or week before, was very hot. And it's a way to go in and make a little money and get the Get the reps in, get the money management down, experience the ups and downs. And again, the bull bear market cycles like once every two to three weeks. So you get to live through a lot of cycles. And for instance, let's say you're trading equities and you come into the market like 1999, or let's say you came in this last run. It might take six months or six years before you hit that next bear market. And you get a little full of yourself thinking that uh, you're, you're the grand poobah or whatever because the market's going up. You could fuse the bull market with brains or brains with bull market. And what's the old saying? A rising rising tide lift all, lifts all egos. A rising market lifts all egos. Anyway, when that bull market, when that bear market hits, you're not going to know what hits you. Whereas with crypto, it happens pretty quick. Anyway, you add everything up. $50 I've mined off, so to speak. In this particular case at 100% and at 200%. And I also took another 25 at that 20% profit target, but that's already factored in. And the mark to market of 717. This is one of the few, if the only crypto position I have left. So, so far, knock on wood, that's 127% return. And again, I'm not setting the world on fire. You annualize this, it's, it's okay. And again, as I often say, I'm just trying to see how far I can parlay a small account kind of for S and G's. And again, I don't think you really need to put a lot of money into these. Here's the trades on the FET, which stopped out last week. The entry was down there at 132 IPT. And again, this was not even a full position. And at 100%, once again, I was able to mine off $25 and then got stopped out here. So we had all that up. And it's much better than the Pokemon. You know, it's a 56% return. And I have a lot of these, uh, all the ones that I've been showing over the past several weeks, uh, except for I think the whatever that one I just showed was Arrow. All of those did stop out. So it looks a lot, a lot similar to what I've showed here. All right, let's shift gears. And I want to talk a little bit about turning the VIX indicator on its head. And as you know, if you've been following me for a while, back in the 90s, I think, I took some of Larry Connor's research and expanded upon it and changed it up a little bit. And he was using fixed numbers back in the day. And he explained to me how the VIX works. And I learned a lot about, about the VIX from that. I learned a lot about volatility too. And a few other things from Larry. You always get something good out of him. And that was a really good... Um, it was a really great experience for me early in my trading career and to be involved with trading markets and all the other traders there. Anyway, so I took what Larry said, literally Larry Connors, and he said that the VIX tends to revert back to the mean. And that's a that's a common characteristic of anything that's volatility based, by the way. So I took mean literally as a moving average and I developed some short term systems for when the VIX gets stretched 10% away or more from the 10 day simple moving average. So the idea is when the VIX is stretched to high levels and it gets to revert back to the mean, then you would buy the market and then vice versa sell the market. Now, as I've said recently in your daily five for stock charts, I don't follow the short term VIX systems per se because well, first of all, they, they will print money for a while, 
until they don't. And that's one thing that I found out in more recent times. So something like the pandemic comes along and volatility gets a little bit out of whack and it might start reverting back to the mean and then take back off again. Doesn't mean that these systems are worthless. It just means that you might want to keep an eye on them for something intraday. Now, anyway, Tom Bowley had an interesting point in a recent presentation, and Tom Bowley's also with StockCharts.com. He's a contributor like me. And his point was that when the VIX gets over 20, he tends to exit the market. And I'll have to dig out his research, and I've got a, a, a mail in, uh, or actually a Twitter private message in with him, to uh, get some more information on it because I found it really interesting. The only thing that that I think could possibly make it better, and again, I don't know his, his exact system. I believe that if the VIX is over 20, he likes to get out of the market. And based on this, and just kind of looking at some random periods of time, you can see this bear market here, this ugly choppy crap that we had back in 2000, for almost all of that, the VIX was above 20. Now, I'm not a huge fan of absolute levels, like I said a second ago, because Larry's work centered around a VIX around 15, which is actually kind of similar to what Tom's doing here. But the VIX changed quickly, and 15 became a number that was obsolete fairly quickly. And the moving averages tend to work better. So maybe something with a moving average to where it's a little bit more of a relative type of move as opposed to a fixed one. But you could see, based on what Tom was saying, when that VIX gets pretty high, it looks like it's a good time to get out of the market. So maybe some sort of VIX thrust could be the answer here. But this is uh, certainly fodder for research. And for now, maybe just look at the numbers above 20. And then in the meantime, we'll figure out a way to possibly use something relative. And I experimented early today with longer term moving averages and they were showing some promise. And then later in the day, I started working around with the 30 EMA so it would adjust a little bit quicker. So again, maybe some sort of relative VIX measurement where you X the market on VIX thrusts higher and buy the market on VIX thrusts lower. And so you could see like right here where the VIX begins to implode below its 30 EMA. And again, the 30 might not be the way to go. And, and maybe there's going to be, uh, I experimented with a couple other things and I encourage you to do the same. I was using multiple moving averages and crossovers and stuff, but there's definitely something here. I just got to flesh it out or just have to flesh it out, I should say. Anyway, so you can see as this VIX begins to implode past that 30, that could possibly be a buying opportunity. And this last leg that we had, as I said in the last week in charts, this Landry light was 107 bars above the 30 EMA. And you would have to go all the way back to 1961 before that record was broken or that broke a record going all the way back to 61. And the thing is, prior to 62, the data was closed only. So it might be historically. So this last run we had was very historic, at least according to that particular metric. But anyway, you've got a thrust higher in here. Uh, Tom Bowley's watching that 20. So again, with relative levels, that might be something that's worthwhile here. And at the least, when the VIX is climbing and high, you probably want to be out of the market. And when the VIX is relatively low, you probably want to be in the market. Now, keep in mind with the short term, short, short, short term systems, like I published, or as I published, I should say, you might be looking for a small spike lower, and then that would be a time to short. So, like right here, you can see you're extended to the downside. So, this could be like a short term short signal, like right in here. And then maybe you could look on an intraday basis and come in here and say, okay, you're at all time highs. This thing is really stretched and due to revert back. Maybe you could play this little intraday reversal here on a day like that. So that's just kind of a short, short term. But Tom is kind of helping me see the forest for the trees with the longer term VIX. So anyway, I'm just kind of scratching the surface here. I, you know me, I like to throw out research as I begin to uncover it. Anyway, this is the, the 
the TFM, these are the zones that are used with TFM 10% system. And this is 95% of the 50 week closing high. And then this one line here is 90% of the 50 week closing high. So, and then the top of this would be the 50 week closing high. So 50 week closing high, less 5%. And then 50 week closing high less 10%. And the TFM 10% system gets out of the market when you close below the 50 simple moving average. That's a bit of a whipsaw filter. And you close below the 10% line, closing that 10% or more zone. Now, Jeff, who was just here a second ago, looks like he checked out for a second, but uh, Jeff pointed out, he's one of my clients, that he likes to get out of the market when you're 5% or more away in other words when you break down out of this green zone now i tested it with the original tfm 10 percent system and it does have merit it would get you out a lot sooner in a lot of cases but of course it would have more whips on so for the system itself we're going to stick with the tfm 10 percent system but for purposes of this uh, new research here it might be worthwhile to figure out a way to stay long in a green zone and exit outside of the green zone or exit in the pink zone, okay? Anyway, so based on that, when you close in the green, and as long as you're in the green, the market is good. You can see a nice little green run here, okay? Decent run here in the green. Didn't set the world on fire, but it was a decent run. And then when you dipped into the red or the pink zone, in this particular case, I should say, you get out so you get in when you're within five percent of the 50 week closing high okay and then you get out when you're five percent or more away now i'm just kind of scratching the surface here it does kind of show some promise so that would be your sell signal there again a close within five percent a close five percent or more away from the 50 week closing high and then you'd have a follow-up buy signal on this day here right when it's within 5% of the 50 week closing high. And again, another decent run. Your next sell signal would be right below this line here. Now, this chart is a day old, so I don't know. We probably are in a sell signal based on this simple system. Now, you would need some whipsaw filters in this, and we'll get to that in just one second. But just for SGs, and, and these are just draft numbers, I just went in and grabbed them as quickly as I could. And couple of things I noticed, number one, the buy and holds like 2,900%, 2,950%. And that's going all the way back to 1984. And this system, so to speak, if it's not a system yet, but let's just call it a system. It does not beat buy and hold, but I'd be willing to bet if you added a few more bear markets into it, it might just be buy and, buy and hold. So 50 something trades going back to 52 trades going back to 1984. That's not that many trades. And with a little bit of a whipsaw filter, you could probably be taken down further, fewer trades that is. Now, one thing I found interesting is the losses really aren't that bad with this. And you looks like you get all of the upside and virtually none of the downside so if you're if you're new to system development and again i'm a discretionary trader i just kind of like to play around with systems every now and then and that's kind of how i cut my teeth i was more of a mechanical type of trader when i got started but then i quickly became a discretionary trader once i was able to uh i can't use the word hookup anymore because the kids say it's, it means something else but once i was able to work with uh, some very smart people who taught me how to read charts I became more and more a discretionary trader. And then the, the mechanical stuff kind of pushed me in that direction too. But uh, it does have some merits, obviously. And it does kind of help you to think about markets and find an edge. And for instance, the, one of the reasons why I'm presenting this tonight is that momentum tends to beget momentum and weakness tends to beget more weakness. And that's why you get out the way when the market is 10% or more away from the 50 week moving average and you close below the 50 week simple moving average. Anyway, I think it's, again, just based on these preliminary numbers, this is pretty impressive. And as I was getting to a second ago, if you're familiar with system trading, you know that 
it's not just about how much money the system makes or even how accurate the system is. It's how much money you lose in the process. Now, there are some systems out there that have horrendous drawdowns, and I would imagine that you probably couldn't you couldn't ride out a 30 or 40 or 50 percent drawdown and and keep your sanity and keep trading the system. So the the percent drawdowns are very important numbers. I don't get into sharp ratios and things like that, but I would imagine this system fleshed out a little bit. The sharp ratios would probably be through the charts, but you can see just a 0%, 2%, very, very, very small losses. Occasional 70% here and there, but that's about it. So that's pretty impressive. Now, it's going to need some whipsaw filters, I would think, maybe two or more days closing in the green zone, or maybe some Landry light above the pink zone, meaning that you have one or two lows, or let's say at least two lows greater than 0.95 of the 50-week closing highs. In some cases, maybe a new closing high or maybe above a moving average. So whipsaw filters keep you from chasing your tail and going in and out too much. The only caveat about a whipsaw filter that I would warn you about is that if you put in too many filters, you end up curve fitting your data to the past markets and future markets will not be the same and i've seen people designing systems and it's like they'll have this one big ugly sell-off which which makes the system mediocre at best and then they'll put in a filter that would have avoided that sell-off and it's like yeah you know that's probably not a good idea so if you keep the simple system super simple then the chances of them being robust in the future are much better. But anyway, two bars of Landry light, so to speak, above the pink zone, which is 0.95 of the 50 week closing high. That might be one way of doing things, or possibly just look for a new closing high based on the 50 week closing high and enter there. Now, obviously the risk is you're getting it a little later, but you also, it also helps to confirm that maybe the trend is getting started. If you're liking this video, please like it. If you're watching on, on YouTube, of course, where you can like it. And if you don't like it, go have no fun somewhere else. <laughs> but uh, please uh, like and subscribe. It helps the channel. And the better the channel does, the more free content I'm able to put out there. All right. We started a series a few weeks back. Before, before we get to that, uh, any questions on anything thus far? I know I threw a lot at you, but... It's pretty simple stuff. If you go through it again, you'll see it's really not that complex. And I'd be really interested in if you could find anything with the with the VIX, VIX thrust, so to speak, or the figure out some parameters without getting too crazy, but figure out a way to say, okay, are we in a longer term VIX thrust higher or a longer term VIX thrust lower or low VIX and how that shakes out with the market. So I'd be interested in getting your feedback on that. All right, a few weeks ago, I started a series on what it means to be a trend-following moron. And a lot of these are the same thing as what it means to be a trend follower and the ups and downs that you will have to deal with as a trend follower. Now, as we talked about last week, the only way to ever make money trading is to capture a trend. So my feeling is, why do I be a trend follower all the time? But anyway, the TFM will be bullish at the top and bearish at the bottom. Hello, Josh, welcome aboard. So we're not trying to outsmart the markets, as I've said quite often. And if you go back and look at the 411 service, which is uh, dated, which is 412, the service 4412, which was published on 411, okay? You could see that the NASDAQ made a new closing high, and I was pretty excited about that. And vis-a-vis -vis the new closing high, I was like, one of my favorite patterns as far as supporting my bullish case, or bullish cases, I should say, is the new closing high. And I'm not going to argue with brand new closing highs. So on 411, when the market was at a brand new high, which could possibly be a top, let's hope it's not, but you know, you gotta be careful. 
when you hope in the market. <laughs> so, but anyway, I was pretty bullish on that day because I thought we had this stealthy closing high, which looks like the, was kind of a look like the market could blast higher. When you have an obvious market breaking out to do highs, everybody and their brother kind of piles in, and then it, it kind of it doesn't last long often, and there's a fake out and things like that. But when you have these stealthy closing highs, sometimes you can get a nice trend continuation. Okay, Jeff says we just touched the five percent line today. So if we close below that tomorrow, it would be a 5% signal. Okay, good to know, Jeff. And again, I want to thank you for giving me that research. That's been a, I know you want to party with me, but that's been a lot of fun working with that. And and it's, a, I think you're definitely on to something with that 5% as a, as a warning line. So anyway, I was bullish at the market high. And you can get these archives at daylander.com slash archives to see warts and all uh, how I handle markets, good, bad, and indifferent. Now, the TFM knows that he will be wrong when the trend ends. As I often say, all trades eventually end badly. We're still long this one, and we've been right for a long, 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 long time. But if this thing goes down and stops out, obviously, in the end, we're going to be wrong. And a corollary to that is, as a trend follower, or as a trend following moron, you're going to spend a lot of your time less wealthy, either waiting for trends to resume or you're waiting for the occasional outlier. So the money as a trend follower tends to come in chunks. It's like you chip away, chip away, chip away, win a little, lose a little, win a lose, little, lose a little, and then bam, you knock it out the park and you catch a few of these elusive outliers. But anyway, so at the peak here, a few days ago on the remaining position on 100 on a hypothetical 100k account okay we already took a thousand dollars off of this position okay so that number would be 6791 total but as far as open profits at least at the peak at 84 was worth the position was worth 5791 now god forbid we stop out way down here We'll stop out for a gain of only three two nine one. Now it's better than the poke in the eye, but that's a couple thousand dollars you're giving up plus, okay? And it's gonna hurt. And but that's that's what trend following is all about, and that's why we take partial profits back here, so we have a little bit smaller position on, and we can ride out these zigs and zags, hopefully, and stay with the trend for a long, long time. Now, we don't know when the trend's going to end. It sure looked like it was ending here, but we didn't get stopped out. It looked a little ugly here, but we didn't get stopped out. And once again, it's looking a little ugly. And now the market's looking a little ugly too. So that's of some concern. Now, getting back to the, the zones charts, this was my, just for SVG's trade, I bought the Qs, and this number was up in the 12s a couple of weeks ago when I did the last year daily five. And at the peak, the profits were 12,985. And if it gets stopped out, it's going to be a big ouch of 6,872. Now, in this particular case, if this was only 100 shares, but it begins to add up, obviously. But I didn't have, I don't have any money management in here, so I'm not taking profits. I'm just going to follow the system mechanically to see how it shakes out. And believe me, that's that's pretty painful. I never dreamed that this market would run 25% or whatever that was over such a short period of time. And that this little smallish type of position, I mean, it's still 30K, but smallish type of position would soon be worth 40 something thousand dollars. So I will give up a big chunk and you know, better love and loss than to never loved at all, right? Okay, Jeff says, are the 5% and 10% systems followed on a weekly basis? Yes. Yes, they are. Okay. Uh, no action until the close on Friday or immediate action to close below. Okay. That's something. Uh, okay. John says, so basically what he's asking, are these done on a weekly basis? And yes, right now I'm doing, doing them on a weekly calendar basis. So it's on a Friday close. So that's, something that I really haven't fleshed out. I think longer term, it probably doesn't make that big of a difference. But yeah, you could get a signal earlier if you were using just a 
just a 5% close as opposed to a weekly signal. So hopefully that clears that up. But yeah, for now, all the research that I did was on a on a weekly calendar basis. So yeah, this we're getting pretty close to that level now. But anyway, that's 60 points. And it's something that I never, you know, here's one thing about system design. When you are designing a system, it's a lot of fun. I don't know, again, you want to party with me, but, and you're thinking like, oh yeah, I just got in here and I wrote this trend. But, but what you don't realize is when you're actually following a system, and again, I don't follow systems mechanically, except for this one, just for S and Gs. But when you actually are following a system, it's a lot harder. The map is not the territory. So you might look at these little blips in the system like, oh, it's getting ugly. Oh, it came right back. You know, and you're like, oh, look at that. You know, $40,000 for this trade. Well, what you're not seeing is $13,000 evaporates down to less than $7,000. And that's kind of an ugly thing to, to live through. Okay. So John says, do you look for above average volume on entries or do you only care about price action? Yeah, I only care about price action. The only volume I'm looking for is to make sure the stock is thick enough to trade. And it seems like those numbers are a little higher than they used to be years ago. I don't know why that is. It seems like I used to be able to trade a stock that's 102 to 100,000 shares, one or 200,000 shares on average. And now I'm finding it seems like you need about 300,000 shares or more on average to trade. So I don't know why that is, but yeah, you do need more volume but i i pretty much ignore volume i could take without going into a long diatribe i i could take either side of the coin when it comes to volume and in some cases in um who was it richard orms i uh, did some research where he talked a lot about ease of movement so let's say a stock goes up on light volume some people might see that as bearish but it actually could be kind of bullish because nobody's wanting to give up their stock and and the buyers are having to raise their ask. So that kind of turns the whole volume argument on its head. The other thing is exchanges, the reporting on the exchanges, how, how are they really reporting? Are they double reporting the dark pools? And it's just a big, it's a mess when you get into volume. The only thing I found somewhat useful was volume by price, where on your chart, if you look over here, like in these zones, you'd have the volume bars coming out based on each price level. And I found that come sort of useful. It's kind of a similar to market profile. But the thing is, it just kind of showed me where support and resistance was. It's something that I could actually eyeball. Like right in the zone here, if we had that volume by price on here, we probably have a big bar coming out right around here. So it's like, yeah, that makes sense. There's a lot of volume in that area. But uh, if you find a use for volume, then, then use it. But I've yet to find a use for volume. And, and I've tried everything over the years. Now, the trend following moron does not seek bargains. He actually pays up for his position and buys on strength. Kind of an interesting story. I, I, and I don't know if I heard this straight from him or not, or, or if it was in trading uh, sardines, but uh, futures broker Damon was talking about uh, a famous trader bought like 400 S&P contracts and he got his price and then he immediately flipped them out. And he's like, well, why are you selling them already? You got your price. He says, he says, I got them too easy. Uh, so he he basically knew it was it was too easy. He would have much rather have paid up for the price. And some, some of my worst fills turn into my best trades. But anyway, this is tr from Trading Full Circle. If you're gonna enter a stock, you're not gonna try to catch the falling knife, so to speak. You're going to enter on strength. So you're going to be buying at a higher level. The risk, of course, is that you're buying at the top and then it rolls over, but it's a chance that you have to take. As I've said 10,000 times, I am shocked at how many losing trades could have been avoided by simply waiting for entries and how many losing trades we do avoid simply by waiting for an entry. On the Landry like pullback, if you get a TKO bar, which is also an ogre, do you wait for the close of a TKO bar or ignore the setup? Um, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking, but you could, let's say you've got, uh, you're talking about two different things, okay? Let's say you've got a trend knockout. A trend knockout is when you have a, a bar that, that goes down really hard. 
sometimes a day after the trend knockout, let's say a trend knockout sets out sets up tonight, well, tomorrow you can have an opening gap reversal, okay? So let's assume that this bar here was a big wide range bar to the downside, oops. Then, and it gaps down to this level here, then you might look to look to play that trade as it comes back up. If you go in and watch the last weekend charts, you can find it on my website. You can also find it on YouTube slash Dave Landry. I, I talked about an opening gap reversal example. Uh, but the question I often get is, can a TKO be within a pullback? Well, a TKO is a form of pullback, okay? The TKO could be a one bar pullback and or just one bar in and of itself, or it can be within a pullback. That's a very common question. So if that's what you're asking, yes. Um, if you're asking about opening gap reversals, there are two different things, but your best opening gap reversals are those after like a TKO where it closes poorly or it's some kind of pullback where the where the market's already pulling back. It's in a great trend. It's pulling back. Gap's lower, shakes everybody out, and then turns around and goes right back up. Now, the TFM knows that you can only predict so far, okay? It's like predicting the weather. I can look outside and see if it's cloudy and thundering. I know it's gonna rain fairly soon or possibly red sky in the morn, you know, I need to take warn. That's an old sailor's adage. I think it's in the Bible too. Uh, and there's some merit to that, but if it looks like it's gonna rain, it's probably gonna rain. But I don't know if it's gonna be raining the day, the day after or next week or next year. And with trend following, you can really only see so far out, okay? So that's why I'm, I'm slotted as a swing trader, but I will stick with positions as long as they move in my favor. Now, I'm kind of anti-reversion to the mean trading. If you know me for a while, I've, I'm a little bit against that type of trading. And in fact, I get more former reversion to the mean type of traders who come to me to cross over to the dark side of being a trend following moron than any other than all the other methodologies combined but anyway i got into a kind of a heated debate with someone once who called me reversion to the mean trader and i thought those were fighting words and come to find out maybe i am a reversion to the mean trader i'm a reversion to the mean trader as he explains within the established trend. Yes, so I trade pullbacks. I'm waiting for that market to become oversold, provided it has a fantastic trend, and then I'm looking to enter as it begins to rally, as I just showed. Now, this move is fairly certain, and, and lately it hasn't been that certain, so fairly is a, I use that term a little loosely, but the chances of this happening are a lot better than the resumption of the longer term trend. Provided you're picking your markets really well, you only have about a 20% chance, if that much, of capturing a longer term trend. I learned that through years and years and years of mechanical system testing. However, your odds are much better of catching that swing trade. And if that works out, you take your partial profits, just like I showed in those crypto trades earlier, and then you stick around as long as you can hang on. You don't throw caution to the wind, you use a fairly liberal stop, but when the Music stops, you have a chair ready and you get out. Anyway, I'm kind of beating this example to death, kind of a dead horse example, beating this dead horse to death, if that makes sense. But again, we took a swing trade profit out back here, and so far we're riding it out to see how long we can stick with it. All right, let's shift gears and go to crypto. If there's any crypto pairs you want me to look at, I'd be happy to do that now, but the, the market is is not so good right now. You can see all these ones in, in um, or most of these ones in Cyan are ones that, that are recently stopped out of. Here's that arrow, and this looks weird. We're on a weekly basis. Wow, look at that. I never looked at a weekly, not that much in crypto. But you can see this one still looks okay. It's pulled back to its 30 EMA. That's a sizable drawdown, I get it. But uh, we're free rolling here and it's up was up over 200% or 300%, I guess, in this particular case. The, yeah, the original entry was down here at 50 cents and then two bucks, that's 400%. So pretty good run there. And again, we mined a little out on both of those, but right now is not the best time for crypto. Let's take a look at Bitcoin. Bitcoin's kind of bouncing back, but it's below the 30 EMA. It's down toward the bottom of this range. 
And all the uh, one thing I do like is all the fear mongers out there, all the I told you so's, they're calling for the end of Bitcoin. Well, they were calling for the end of Bitcoin when it was much, much lower. There's this one guy, I can't think of his name, and I'm not going to throw him under the bus, but he's been a skeptic of Bitcoin and, and talking about how it's all fake and everything. And somebody pointed out that he's he's been saying these things since it was like 100 or 1,000. I forget how much, but but not much. I know someone else who sent out countless newsletters about what a scam Bitcoin was and how stupid it is and everything. And that was way back when it was less than 4,000. And it's ran, as you know, to 75,000. So he's probably right, but he's a little early. Um, um, it, it's, um, excuse me, I've got something happening here. Um, as I said, the last week of charts, it, markets are markets. And if it's headed higher, it's headed higher. And don't get too caught up in, in the... Um, and, and what a company does or what the coin does or whatever, just follow along. As a trader, you can make a lot of money in these things and in markets, provided that you don't care. And that's kind of the whole thing I'm kind of getting to with the trend following moron speeches is you don't get too caught up in the markets and you don't care. And if it's going up, it's going up, it's going down, it's going down. I know easier said than done, but if you could if learn to think like a trend following moron, which sometimes I have to force myself to do, you'll uh, your life is going to get a lot easier as a trader. Not not tomorrow, but over time. Okay, as I said quite often, and maybe we have a new bull market developing, but sometimes you could just come in here and buy the ones that are going straight up with a few caveats. Now's probably not the best time to do that, but if we start bouncing. Especially if Bitcoin begins to get back about that 30 and begins to rally, we should be okay with the crypto. Yeah, that pro does look good, uh, Harry, and, and welcome back. Good to see you. Yeah, I'm just I'm just seeing this because I really haven't been doing a lot of analysis over the last few days. I'm mostly flat, like I said, but that is kind of interesting. Uh, it's not a perfect setup, but it's kind of interesting. I mean, for for a crypto, it's a perfect set up uh, maybe in or above this this high here this is one i got in recently i don't know if it's the ipt or not i think i got in here and then stopped out down here somewhere and i can look that trade up for next week if you want but yeah i agree with you on that that's one of the better looking ones out there uh let's take a look at your ethereum real quick now ethereum looks pretty ugly in here you can see you've got a lot of landry light below that 30 EMA, and that that looks like it's topped out to me. Let's take a look at Bitcoin versus Ethereum. You can see Bitcoin's been outperforming Ethereum quite a bit. 360 entry in a pro. Let's take a look at that. Yeah, that uh, 360 might be a little bit on the high side. Uh, you're gonna miss a little bit of that reversion to the mean move. I would I would get it. Uh, I'd be a little bit more aggressive on that one. But again, you're you probably shouldn't be betting the form on this. So yeah, definitely be careful. All right, let me shift gears. Let's get over to stocks and let me get that screen shared up. But yeah, 360 is plausible. Maybe closer to 350, 345. Might be a little bit more aggressive entry on that one. And let me check for comments, questions. Okay, we're good to go. Okay, S&P 500. S&P 500 is on the cusp of making a bow tie to the downside, and that would mean that the 10 is less than the 20, and the 20 is less than the 30. We're not quite there, but we're getting there quickly. One thing that I pay careful attention to is the inflection point of the moving averages into the 30 EMA, I'm sorry, into the 50 simple moving average. And by the way, we now have downside Landry light. But you can see we had this tremendous run. Look at all this Landry light above the 30 EMA. And look at the 50-day Landry light. That was a pretty good run. That's like 110 days or so. But now that's unfortunately has come to the end. It's not the end of the world just yet. So far, it just looks like we're pulling back. But obviously, we need to stop at some point. Let's take a look at NASDAQ. NASDAQ Composite 
a little bit uglier than the peas. And again, notice the inflection points of the inflection angle coming into that 50 simple moving average. And let's see, we're not quite crossed over just yet. The 10 is less than the 20, but the 20 is not less than the 30 yet, but it's it's happening, okay? Probably tomorrow we'll have a downside bow tie proper order. Proper order is just if the 10 is above the 20 and 20 is above the 30, and it can, it can be in the keyword in that sense, sentence. It's just a, a momentum type vindicator to help keep you on the right side of the market. As a general statement, if they're an uptrend proper order, as they have been for a long, long, long time, you want to be generally long a market, and then just the opposite for a downtrend proper order. Let's take a look at the Rusty. Rusty is just still ugly as it has been forever. We have crossed over with the bow ties here. Again, notice the angle of inflection, how sharp that is. That that tells me that's an ugly market. And we're banging out these new multi-month lows. This action puts us below short-term overhead supply, which is below a ton, a ton of overhead supply way back here. So Rusty just still looks ugly, kind of same as it ever was, same as it ever was. Now, gold, the commodity, looking okay in here, just off of these multi-year highs. So that's certainly a good thing there. Gold stocks have wake, have woken up in here. They're looking pretty good. They're a little wide and loose, and a lot of them have overhead supply. So that's one thing that's kind of interesting there. Okay, Jeff says a $3 lower close in the IWM tomorrow will put it below the 10% TFM line. That's interesting. Yeah, so we'll have to watch that. So yeah, I, the bottom line is, and thanks for bringing it up, Jeff, is that we're we're kind of on the cusp of some some ugliness here, and I hate to use the word hope. Let's hope we're just having a correction and everybody gets shaken out. But I'm not saying you should sell the farm, but you might want to have it appraised. Gold doing pretty good. Energy is another one of those areas doing pretty good, as you can see. Nice little pullback here. So I'm keeping an eye out for some setups in gold and energies. The only problem with energies right now is most of the the good looking ones or at really high levels, and I kind of hate to be buying into them at these high levels, but as a trend following moron, I shouldn't care whether they're high or not. I know, I know. Let's take a look at the semis. This is a bit of a bummer because the semis were kind of the last of the Mohicans, and as you know, I'm a huge fan of the semis supporting what happens in the overall market, and now it's not a good thing. If the semis head lower and the market heads lower, that would not be good, okay? Look at that, the S&P. If this move ended up being a pullback, where would you enter a long position? Uh, well, technically, I'm still long the TFM system with the Qs, so I'm long on that. Uh, he's asking, where would you enter the S&P 500? Um, just, I don't know, 51.10 or so, maybe a little bit higher. I'd like to see it get past a little bit of this overhead supply. So I wouldn't I wouldn't take a brand new position in and of itself, but if you have any longer term positions on, if things worsen tomorrow, I, like really get ugly, you might have to get out the way. We're oversold, but that in and of itself isn't reason to buy a market, as you probably know. Home builders, another one of those areas that's kind of in the bummer column, a little support down here, but they're in the process of bow tying lower. They start to look kind of ugly here. I'm starting to see some setups. On the short side, materials following suit there, not looking too pretty. Uh, financials are kind of on the cusp of a rollover here, right at a bow tie crossover. So that's starting to look a little ugly, kind of a pioneer type of setup. It's not the end of the world just yet. One or two big up days would put us back above the moving averages and have them turn back up. That'd be great. But you have to believe in what you see and not what you hope, right? Believe what you see, not what you believe. Take a look at the healthcare. That was one of the first areas beginning to break down. Sharp angle of attack into the 30 EMA that I've been talking about. So that's looking fairly ugly. Okay, uh, you kind of get the idea. Only a few areas to buy and a lot of ugly areas. We could start putting some shorts on fairly soon. And I'm beginning to see a few set up. Ideally, I like to see a little bit of a bounce in the overall market before looking to short, just so those shorts aren't. We're not selling it to such oversold markets. All right, any any individual stocks you guys want to look at? I know since the we started Facebook group, we don't have as many stocks to look at in this. So anything you want me to look at? And there's not a whole lot of great looking stocks out there right now, too. Okay, going once, going twice. 
All right, quiet bunch tonight. Well, as usual, I want to thank everybody for attending. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, GD, here we go. We always get one at the last minute. <laughs> I guess I need to give uh, more warning. Yeah, uh, GD GD looks kind of interesting. The the only problem here, and Harry's like, is the is the pullback deep enough? The, the pullback's okay, but the only thing is the HV is 11, and that's a very low HV. Let's take a look at the spiders. Spiders is not much above that. As a general statement, you're not going to beat the market with stocks that are lower in volatility than the market itself. And then uh, the other thing is bad things can still happen. So I think the pullback's probably deep enough given the HV of this stock, but I would pass on it based on that HV. Also, you take a look at defense. And defense is another one of those areas, if I could find it. Anybody know the symbol on top of the head? Is it? Uh, I forget the exact symbol. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Here's one. DTII. Nope. WDC. KTOS. ITA. Is that it? Yeah. Defense stocks, like everything else, is beginning to look a little questionable in here. You can see it kind of beginning to roll over. So it's kind of hard for me to get too excited about getting long defense at this moment. I mean, unless the setup really knocked my socks off. So this is this is one of the better looking setups out there, uh, Jeff. Good job. Uh, you know, my only I'm not a huge fan of buying into into markets that are approaching their all time highs like this. I much prefer if they were in well, this is an all time highs, but I much prefer if they were a little bit uh, clear air above like a peak like this. But it's a pretty good looking stock, and you see the HV is a little bit higher on this one. And so far, it's just pulled back. I think this is probably one of the better looking setups out there. Um, it can almost pull back a slight bit more, but I, I think that looks pretty good, Jeff. So overall, uh, I think that's worth a shot. All right, Edward wants to talk about MSOS. Never heard of it. Uh, let's see. Oh, that's cannabis. Um, if you take a look and take a look at um, what's some of the other ones? Is it weed? Some of these other cannabis indexes look a little bit better than than that one but weed is kind of bottomed out but it is it is kind of wide and loose i do have one recommended as a buy for tomorrow but uh what's the off the top of my head i don't remember what the what's the cannabis uh i know there's yolo is one of them anybody know that there's, there's a big ceo oh, mj is what i'm thinking about for mary jane so they're not the best looking charts in the world, but it looks when you back them way out, they just look like this major, major bottom is in place. And then let's take a look at uh, MJ. MJ looks like a major bottom longer term, but it is a little wide and loose shorter term. Like if I was just looking at this short term chart here, this daily chart, I wouldn't be too, too excited about it. But if you back it way out, you can see these things are bottoming out. And maybe that process has not ended just yet. So on an individual basis, there are some some cannabis stocks that I think might be worth a shot, but as usual, you want to wait for entry. CRMD is that a um, Corbex? Okay, yeah, this one's a little wide and loose, um, so I would have a hard time going after it. Uh, you might be able to find something a little bit cleaner out there, but that's that's kind of a crazy one. Yeah, it's a little too wide and loose, so I'd be careful on that one, Harry. NKTR in in K A T R. Yeah, there you go. That's that's much better. Okay. Even though it's a cheapy. Now, forget about what's happening back here for a second. If we just look at this stock and forget about the price, it's ran up nicely. It's got a deep pullback. So that's that's pretty good looking stock. So high five on that. I would not personally take it though. You see this big old fat gap right here? Markets have long memories, so I would be willing to bet when it got above 175 or so, you would see some selling come into this market. So it doesn't have clear air above, but yeah, shorter term that looks fantastic, especially given this market. So good eye, shorter term, longer term, uh, I think there's some issues. All right, anything else? Going once, going twice. Well, as usual, I want to thank everybody for attending. I appreciate you taking time out of busy schedule to be here. Thank you, you guys and girls on YouTube, for giving it one more shot. <laughs> I think we got it figured out. Let's not spit too high in the air, but I think we got it figured out. I'll see most of you, I think, that are here tonight, tomorrow, and Facebook. Everyone else 
Have a great weekend. If you have any questions unanswered, Dave at DaveLandry.com. Thanks again for attending, and may the trend be with you.